Um, my name is Lise McDowell. I have the privilege of introducing the Mayo clinicians that are going to be here. I'm going to, I'm reading off of this, my, my bad, but um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Matthew Forth. He is the Assistant Professor of Neurology at the Mayo Clinic in Phoenix, Arizona, and he is the Program Director of the Epilepsy and EEG Fellowship Program there. Also, Dr. Amir Bondé, <laughs> James Bond, <laughs> is currently the EEG Fellow at Mayo Clinic in Arizona, but he'll be joining the Mayo Clinic in Eau Claire, Wisconsin uh, after his fellowship. And without further ado, yes. Dr. Horton and Dr. Bond, Bond Day. Yes, thank you so much uh, for having us. I think it also said Dr. Servin was on the list of speakers. Can you guys hear me okay? Or do I, should I use the microphone? Are we doing some sort of recording? Yeah, we use the mic. Okay, I'll stand up here. Um, so yeah, Dr. Servin was going to join us uh, from our Florida campus, but unfortunately he had to get pulled away for some other things. Um, but yes, yeah, so thanks for coming. Um, and uh, you see the title here, Individualizing Your Epilepsy Care. And so what we're gonna try to do, I was going to, uh, we're going to go over kind of all the different things that Mayo Clinic has to offer. Now, I will just say that um, even though I say these things about Mayo Clinic, there's doesn't mean that the other uh, people here who you may be interacting with from the other institutions here, they have basically all the same things, right? So wherever you're getting care or whatever you're, you're doing, these all the things that we're talking about probably apply to those other places. Um, of course, we know our institution kind of well, so that's why we're gonna kind of talk about what we have, uh, but it's no in no way to kind of say that, you know, any other place is not giving great care because I know that all the places that were invited to be here at this expo are like the the high level quality care or else they wouldn't have been invited here so we're, we're very honored to to be a part of that uh, and to be here but uh, Mayo Clinic I'll, I mean I might point out like some slight differences right to Mayo Clinic and and, and who we are because you might have some like we do have a few TV commercials out there and those sorts of things and so what does this all mean so um, without further ado, um, so we have, the, so the Mayo Clinic has um, basically three main um, larger campuses. Um, it all started up in our Rochester, Minnesota campus. Um, there's a lot of different Rochesters throughout. Rochester, Minnesota is just like a little bit south of uh, uh, the Twin Cities, Minneapolis. Um, that's kind of our largest site, um, but they did, um, because People don't like to spend the winters up there for whatever reason, right? Yeah. So they did have, they did develop in, uh, this was, you'll hear me kind of referring to the Mayo brothers. Like there was a, there was a father Mayo and then there's two Mayo brothers who really developed the, the Mayo clinic, but they recognize a lot of people leave for the, for the winter months. And then, but then where do they go? They go to Arizona and they go to Florida. So they actually developed these other sites in uh, Phoenix and Jacksonville, which uh, Dr. Mbande and I are, are from right now from the Phoenix area. Um, but we've developed these other sites uh, to help those people who kind of spent part time elsewhere. But guess what? Now, like Jacksonville, pretty large population. Phoenix now is like the fifth largest metropolitan area in the country. It's, it's not so much just for those kind of people who move around. It's for, for everybody, right? And so, um, and then, uh, and so having these kind of sites strategically across the country allows us to kind of be able to kind of help a lot of people in a, bit, a lot of different areas. So I'll just say this here, is that we're very used to seeing people who are out of state. So very commonly I'll see people from New Mexico, Nevada, Washington State, California, whatever, because they want to come and, you know, see us get maybe another opinion or even just get their care there because it's pretty easy to make it to Phoenix. Now, we have more than just these three sites, so we actually have a vast network more in the Midwest, so if, you, if anybody's from the Midwest. Um, we have a lot of different sites, and uh, sorry, this came out maybe, I don't know how big it is on your screen, but um, we have various sites throughout mostly Minnesota and Wisconsin, but Eau Claire here is where Dr. Mamadi is gonna be helping uh, starting this next year. Um, and so these are all kind of Mayo Clinic sites uh, providing actually pretty high level care, even though maybe they may be smaller hospitals than our, than our other hospitals. Now, in addition to that, we also have this thing called the Mayo Clinic Care Network, and this is a little bit different. These are not Mayo Clinic owned uh, hospitals, 
uh, or institutions, but they do partner with Mayo Clinic where we do provide them with some ec additional like um, support uh, in terms of like maybe how our processes are, um, information in terms of like, um, you know, cutting edge sort of things or techniques. And so like we've kind of partnered with them, they're not part of our hospitals, but we do actually, um, you know, it's, it's a bit worldwide. So we're trying to kind of expand our reach even though we may only be able to be in these kind of physical specific areas, we partner with other hospitals to give them support they need to give uh, higher, more advanced care. Um, so that's our Mayo Clinic Care Network. Now, this is hopefully my only kind of braggy slide. I hate to be braggy, but I kind of, I'm supposed to say these things, I think, maybe. But yeah, the Mayo Clinic, and or especially our Rochester Hospital, which is our biggest one, is ranked number one hospital in the nation. There's even other other rankings that say like this is like number one hospital in the world um, and um, but specifically for neurology and neurosurgery I'm not saying again there's other other hospitals that are very you know great out there systems for specifically neurology and neurosurgery you can see the rankings there our Florida and our uh, Arizona hospitals specifically they're about the third of the size of our, our Rochester hospital um, and, and institution there. Basically, the city of uh, Rochester, Minnesota is like built around the Mayo Clinic. Uh, it's pretty much all of it that's there. Uh, it's like cornfields and then like Mayo Clinic. Um, and so it, it does, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a sight to be seen, but I mean, we do pretty well in our rankings. Uh, I mean, these are against much larger hospitals and you'll kind of see our Jacksonville Phoenix. We kind of say our, our rankings are a little lower because the hospitals are not physically that big. We're, we're clinically productive and you know see a lot of outpatients like in our clinics, but the physical hospital is actually not that big, and that some of the rankings are based on that. So sorry, not gonna get on, on that. But okay, so what is it about Mayo Clinic? What is like a little bit um, uh, about us? And uh, I put this quote at the bottom here. If you kind of read that, it says the best interest of the patient is the only interest to be considered. Um, these are the Mayo brothers, uh, Smith William Mayo, who uh, is the older brother that said this quote. Uh, and what we actually really, this is, this quote is kind of what we live on. Um, it's, it's very patient centered. And a lot of the, again, a lot of the, the higher, the higher tiered uh, medical centers do have this very patient centered approach. Um, but we kind of live it. Um, and I'm not saying others don't, but uh, this is what drives us. This is what drives us to be better and try to always do the best for our patients because if we focus on that on the patient you know the rest we hope falls into place like our CEO is is a physician like it's a physician-led organization it's not a business person leading it it's a physician we do have business people that kind of pair up against that but it always puts the patient first right and specifically for epilepsy we have these kind of four different things that we kind of look at and I'll be talking about like the maybe the first first one um, and then we'll have Dr. Mabande talk about some of the other um, advanced tools and techniques but um, so we have teamwork we have you know nationally rec recognized expertise uh, we have advanced diagnostic tools and uh, latest technology we have to have all these things in order to put the patients first and do the best for each and every single one of our patients that shows up so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I'm just going to show you like our, our epilepsy team. So in Rochester, like I said, our biggest group of people um, for just specifically our adult uh, population, we have two, shoot, I might have missed one of the other neurosurgeons or two other neurosurgeons there. Uh, we see how many epilepsy specialists we have kind of on there. Uh, Dr. Britton's uh, uh, one of our um, heads of the uh, EG lab up there. Dr. Casino is actually like our our um, head of uh, our whole division across the country, and we communicate with them, uh, you know, quite a bit. Dr. So used to be the president of our of the National Epilepsy Society um, thing. Um, so yes, all these people. Um, we do have like a robust pediatrics team. You guys may have seen uh, Dr. Nichols here doing some of the genetics talks and different things at, at our booth and those sorts of things. But um, Dr. Worrell here is, if you, if you guys have ever been on the epilepsy.com website, she's actually in charge of that website, or one of the co-leaders of that. Um, can you guys see my, you probably can't see my, <laughs> sorry, you can't see my um, my actual pointer. Okay, yeah, that's Dr. Worrell down there. Dr. Nichols is over there. Okay, um, I'll stop using the pointer. 
And this is our Eau Claire team. Again, it's like a smaller hospital, but Dr. Spritzer is there, head of neurology there. Dr. Mabandi is going to be joining uh, shortly. Um, and then uh, our team here at Arizona, uh, Dr. Parker, who's kind of down at the bottom there, he was given some talks. He's one of our neurosurgeons who's very uh, passionate about uh, not just making people uh, seizures and epilepsy better, but, uh, you know, heads a lab for neuromodulation and trying to figure out the best way to stimulate people's brain to help their seizures. Uh, but we have kind of an expansive team here. Uh, it's going to get larger soon. And here's our Florida um, colleagues here um, who uh, obviously are they're again, doing great work there with uh, Dr. Tatum. And actually, Dr. Servant, who's out here, was supposed to be uh, down the bottom left. You may be hearing him on NPR and things, but he's uh, basically retired now, which we're very <laughs> sad about. Um, but anyways, so tons of people. You see, like, across the country, we, we're actually, we talk and we have conversations about patients not too infrequently, uh, do a lot of different things together. Uh, it's like kind of strength in numbers uh, in some ways. But, um, you know, our core epilepsy team generally comprises of, uh, like, neurosurgery, uh, so neurology, neurosurgery, neuropsychiatry, neuroradiology kind of coming together when we have our kind of more specific discussions but, you know, um, sometimes it takes a village. And so everybody's epilepsy is unique, right? Uh, we know epilepsy is not really just one disease or there's not just one cause, right? So we do lean on our other colleagues, even in neurology, quite a bit. So um, things like strokes. Strokes can cause seizures, right? And so we have expert stroke doctors. I can say, oh, I can treat your seizures, but, you know, what about your strokes? Like, have we addressed those? What do we need to do about that, right? Uh, we have neuro-oncology, obviously tumors and uh, seizures. Uh, neuroimmunology seems to be a very um, frequent topic that we kind of talk about. Um, not all that common of a cause, but we do see it actually, we see the uncommon stuff at Mayo Clinic. So uh, we do see a lot of people with um, uh, autoimmune epilepsy, if you've never heard of that uh, term. Uh, and people have cognitive issues with seizures. They have headaches with seizures and so all these people like if I you know get stuck on a roadblock I'm like I've tried a medicine or two to help your headache but I just need a little extra I have like world experts in headache that are just you know uh, knocking the door away so it makes it very easy to do that and then even across all of our specialties not just neurology but um, like our transplant center is very um, Robust. We have, I think we've, at our hospital in Arizona, we've done the most, we've hit like 6,000 kidney transplants we've done, uh, which I think is the highest in the nation or something like that. Very robust cancer center. Uh, so, I mean, people who are dealing with cancer end up with seizures sometimes. We do all these uh, evaluations and, you know, cardiac, and it goes on and on. So, uh, what makes my job very easy is that I can do epilepsy care very well, and then I don't actually have to worry that. Maybe their diabetes isn't getting treated all that well because I can have a diabetes specialist, you know, you know, around the corner and um, they can help take care of that. And they don't have to worry about the seizures because they know that they've got me. Right. So um, that's what, again, makes um, life easy. Yeah, I put a few quotes in here, you know. Um, and we also have some very specialized multidisciplinary clinics um, that are there. Uh, so we talked earlier this morning, if you caught our other, one of our other talks about transitioning from pediatric to adult care, it's kind of a big deal in that uh, less than 25 year old to, to say like, how do we launch people into adulthood? It's a big deal. So that's like a specialty clinic where we bring kind of multiple people together with like our primary care and our social work and, and then we can actually really kind of focus on, you know, a certain thing. But we have other like specialty neurology clinics, like our MS clinic uh, has you know a multidisciplinary approach where we have physical therapists coming in and the neurologist and other things. We got ALS, cavernous malformations. We have a new genetics program that actually we're just launching um, uh, that I just got an email about. We'll talk about that later, Dr. Like <laughs> we just got an email yesterday about how we're going to be doing genetics a little bit differently. So you get like genetic counselors and they'll talk to you before they do the genetic testing, and then we'll partner with them from the neurology side to kind of find out what's most important. Um, and then we even have like programs for like rare and undiagnosed um, under our individualized medicine um, umbrella. It's mostly out of our Rochester campus. Um, it's a lot of different things. So with that, 
I'm going to I'm going to hand the floor over to Dr. Mbande. Oh, and if I didn't mention, we're going to try to leave some time for questions afterwards. So if you guys want to just even ask us random stuff that isn't even in this um, presentation, happy to do so. So, Dr. Mbande. Thank you, Dr. Hirsch. Um, hi, everyone. So my, my name is Dr. Mbonde. I'm, I'm from originally from Uganda. I, I came straight from Uganda to the Mayo Clinic in Arizona. Uh, in 2018, this is my sixth year at the Mayo Clinic. I did spend a year at Harvard uh, and then came back to Mayo Clinic. But I, you know, I just wanted to preface um, my talk by saying that it's uh, quite an amazing place. Just looking at the teamwork and the sheer dedication that the entire institution have has for each individual patient is very humbling. And that's part of the reason why I have decided to stay on and I'll be moving to Eau Claire as mentioned. It's, it's incredible. The, there's quite a number of diagnostic tools that are employed during the diagnostic workup and management of uh, persons uh, with, with seizures. But as you all know, Electroencephalography, which is the study of brainwave activity, is quite fundamental and it's one of the most important tools that we use in the workup of patients. And there's a range of EEG studies that are offered, you know, all the way from a routine study that is as brief as 30 to 45 minutes, gives you a snapshot of what's going on in terms of the brain activity, all the way to the epilepsy monitoring unit where we bring in patients for five days, sometimes even longer, and, and, and make uh, for, for, for various reasons. For example, diagnostic reasons, if we want to capture a particular type of seizure or spell and try to characterize it, medication adjustments, but even more importantly, the, uh, as part of the pre-surgical workup of a patient. And it's this, this all speaks to the individualization of testing that needs to be done. So not everyone will require a specific type of EEG. It's all about what's best for a particular patient at a particular moment. And that's what drives the, the decision to pick one or the other. We have MRIs for looking at brain architecture, ranging from the standard MRI, um, which also provides intraoperative guidance during resection or ablation of, of epileptogenic foci, but then we also have the 70 MRI that gives more of a, a, a clearer resolution of brain structures in order to try and identify um, a particular focus of seizure. And again, which, which tool is used is also uh, an, a, a very, very individualized process which entails um, patient assessment and also um, deciding what's best for the patient. There are specialized MRIs that are used. The, the functional MRI, I find it to be extremely fascinating because it allows the providers to map out the areas of the brain that um, are eloquent or have critical function. So then you know what not to touch. <laughs> when you are going for the, you know, this is for the resective phase for individuals who have an identified focus or area that is generating the seizures and, and needs to be resected. The CISCOM is a study where we inject a tracer in the patient at the time of a seizure and it helps light up the areas of hyperactivity and it's also a kind of MRI um, in a way but the tracer is what uh, allows us to see the, the, the area of 
activity during a seizure and that sort of taken together with all the other data will help us identify the focus of, 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 the, of the seizure onset. Intraoperative MRI, as mentioned earlier. Um, then there's also the PET scan, which looks at glucose metabolism within the, the temporal lobes of the brain, which is the area, uh, an area which is uh, highly seizurogenic. And so that's all part of the supportive data that we gather before making treatment decisions. Neuropsychological testing and also water, uh, cognitive evaluations or test for cognition. WADA in particular looks at memory and sort of simulates what will happen memory-wise if, for example, one temporal lobe is resected. Let's say a temporal lobe, right or left, is the focus of seizure onset and you want to take it out. But because we know that the temporal lobe is very important for memory, then you try to simulate that using this WADA test in order to see what the effect of that will be. And everything, not every patient, again, gets all these tests, but it's a more um, tailored approach for each and individual um, patient. Treatments that we offer fall into three categories. Medications, dietary, dietary modifications, and surgical approaches. Whichever approach we decide on depends on a particular individual's seizure type. We have all these first generation, second generation, and newer generations of anti-seizure medications that is a tailored approach and depends on wh whichever kind is chosen is guided by you know, anticipated side effect profile or the type of seizures or what has been tried before and, and, and things like that. I, I really enjoy our epilepsy surgery case conference. I think it's very unique and I've had the opportunity to present in them. Um, you have multidisciplinary a multidisciplinary aggregation of different teams, neuropsychologists, surgeons, or epilepsy surgeons, the epileptologists, you have social workers there, you have the nurses there, and each case is presented and discussed by everybody in order to determine the right surgical approach for the individual. So this is all these brains sitting together for an hour to basically review every detail about an individual and then come up with, hey, this is what we can offer and this is what we anticipate will happen. Or, hey, we talked about this, I don't think we'll be able to offer surgery, but these are the medications, so this is the diet. The output of this conference, I think it's, um, I think that there's a lot of resources, time, and, and dedication that goes into this, which is quite unique. And the individualization of care is this, because I will say that nearly everyone we see is unique, complex, and has been through multiple layers of treatment and so it always comes down to this discussion. That's not to say that, um, that an individual epileptologist or an individual neurosurgeon cannot make the decision at the time of the visit and, and, and conclude. I mean, that can also happen. There are instances where you, know, you get seen and, and the epileptologist is able to give a conclusive sort of 
um, summary and plan at the end of the visit. That, that can also happen. But in cases where surgery is being discussed, it ends up here. And the, before surgery, the next step is intracranial monitoring, which, is, which can be looked at as either one group being the implantation of grids or, or, or strips to look at a, a target area that is more superficial. So you start off with the EEG, the MRIs, and then you zone in into an area and say, I think we think that the seizures are coming from here. Then you put a strip or a grid if it is superficial, but if it's more of a deep focus, then we do the, um, the um, intracranial depth electrodes, which are uh, if the, if, where is my mouse? These oh, it's like a double screen thing, so you can't, uh, you can't okay. see it if it's over there. Okay. So these, these electrodes are implanted into the brain and each electrode has several contacts on it and they're all recording and then we're able to sort of um, fine tune our hypothesis relating to where we think the seizures are coming from. And then it's from there where you can say that this area is next to critical function of the brain so we can cut it out or cannot cut it out. And that's the stereo EEG. In terms of surgical treatment approaches, um, you have the res you, you have resection if the there are no if the area of seizure onset is not close to critical brain function and, and, and that is what sort of determines how much we can cut out. And it's resection that is that gives you that gives one the best chance of cure or seizure freedom. But not everyone can have resection. In, in, in that case, you can have laser ablation of a focus. And you know, our teams across all the three sites uh, have, you know, uh, have the experience and are well versed with both surgical treatment approaches. And whichever approach is chosen is really individualized. With regards to neuromodulation, so let's say you know everyone has looked at the case and they've said, hey, you know, resectional ablation is not safe or not feasible. Then the other offer on the table is a vagus nerve stimulator, where you have the generator placed in the chest, and then you have the electrodes placed onto the vagus nerve, and it delivers continuous. Um, uh, pulses of electricity over time leading to neuromodulation of brain circuits that trigger or control seizures. You can have a deep brain stimulation where you have these electrodes that are placed within <coughs> the thalamus. The thalamus is thought of as a very uh, critical um, circuit of the epi of, of seizure generation. And so modulating that should help reduce the frequency of seizures per se. These are not seizure curative options. The individuals will often still need to be on medications. That is not to say that the surgical approach is also, it's not to say that the surgical approach is completely take away medications. It, it's it's with time that hopefully individuals can be off medications. Then there's the RNS, which is this responsive neurostimulation device and kind of works in the same way. And all these options are available at any of the Mayo Clinic campuses. And the same approach that is done during evaluation of an individual is is um, the, the same in any of the main campuses of the Mayo Clinic. Thank you so much for coming and for listening. Yeah.
So um, I'll, I'll kind of uh, wrap up and say, um, you know, our, a little, I think this is our previous CEO, but right before, I don't think this has changed, but uh, kind of addressed the staff and they, they told us the expectation for the Mayo Clinic is we need to be seeing the top five to 10% of the complicated cases in whatever our field was, like across all of our specialties, not just epilepsy, um, but everything. But they, the expectation was we were supposed to see the complex cases. Like this was this is our task, this is what we've been set up for, um, that we don't shy away from the difficult, right? Um, which I, I've been doing a lot of pondering actually before kind of giving this talk and it's like, well, okay, I decided to give a talk about like what, how do we individualize care for people? Like how do we do this, right? Which then basically means like if we're gonna see the most complex people, what we have to do is um, make sure, well, this is, this is the steps involved here. The first step is we have to sit and listen to each individual patient that shows up to us. That sounds kind of like a silly thing. I teach our medical students too. I'm in charge of their medical school course. And like one of the things I, I tell them First off, Dr. Mabani will know because he's helped me teach in this course, is like, you gotta, you gotta listen. You gotta first listen to your patients and say like, what is it that you actually need? What is it that you want? I mean, most of our patients tell us we wanna get rid of the seizures. Okay, that's absolutely, that's like, without even thinking about it, like this is, that's what people want when they show up. But what about the rest of your life, right? There are different goals that everybody has that are different and that makes it's such that we're going to need to kind of tailor the nuances of their treatment and individualize it based on, you know, them, who they are as a person. Somebody who's a little bit older and maybe heading towards retirement is gonna be a very different sort of thing than somebody who's maybe 18 and just graduating high school, right? Um, and so we need to take all those pieces into account. So that's why step one, identify needs, right? Step two, well, we have to have all the different kinds of testing available to us because if we don't know what your needs are, right, we have to be set up to have every single test available to us. There's a couple that we don't have, and I'll admit that, like uh, you guys may have heard of like MEG scans. Well, well, we don't have one in our Arizona campus. We're gonna be putting one in our Rochester campus, but we have them available to us at some of these other great institutions, and we'll utilize that for people, right? But we have to have all the, all the latest diagnostic tools available to us to be able to kind of figure, figure you out, figure the patients out, right? Um, which is then a lot, like we gotta have a lot of stuff. <laughs> and then, but we have to have the expertise of people who know how to use all that stuff to be able to kind of make use out of it. And then the last part is, well, kind of take all those diagnostic tools and then apply like and then figure out what to do with them and like treat you in the right way and so we have to have all the medicines available to us we have to have all the fancy fancy surgical tools we have to have all the fancy devices and all these things and techniques and lasers and all these things to be able to kind of like pick what's just right for you um, and as I was thinking about this it's like it's a big task <laughs> like we got a lot to do but if we want to take care of the most complicated people well, we gotta be able to do everything and we gotta be able to do everything good. Uh, I'm not saying we're perfect. I mean, certainly there's no, no perfect place, and, 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 but um, we gotta try, right? And my motto is, and this is, sorry, I do a lot of teaching <laughs> in the, uh, our medical students. One of the other things I tell them besides listen to your patients is like my first, like my two mottos of, of, of the secret to life is step one, um, be nice. Like start with being nice. We might not have all the answers, we know everything right away, right? But we're gonna try to figure that. And then the number two is to try, right? And if you're nice to people and you try, that gets us actually really, really far. But it's, it's great to have all these fancy tools and all these other things. But like that's kind of how we need to kind of start with the approach is like just sit down and talk to people. Um, then all the other things we have at our disposal will fall into place. Anyways. Um, sorry, now I gotta get on a soapbox, right? So, um, yes, so we'll stop with this, this quote by uh, another Charlie Mayo quote. 
If we excel at anything, it's in our capacity for transforming, tra translating idealism into action, right? And so these like little things we bring with us. It's like, yes, we're a little idealistic. We want, we want it all. We want to do everything. We want to do it all well. But uh, it's not always the easiest. But we, we're gonna, we're gonna try, right? Uh, so with that, uh, we're ending a little early, but figure we'll open up to questions. It doesn't have to be about anything, even in the slideshow. But um, yeah. Sorry, uh, I think we might have had a hand up over there first, but we'll get, we'll get to everybody, yeah. So, um, if you handle the toughest of the tough, or, or we, we try, we try, tough, yes. Is that based on physician referral or self-advocacy? Oh, good, good, good question. Um, so, you know, we did have a very strong tradition of like physician referral. Like, we used to like not advertise or say anything and say like, you know, we're gonna, tell all the doctors that, hey, we're doing all these advanced things and come send people. It's not the way we do it anymore, right? So actually anybody can pick up the phone, uh, call Mayo Clinic, go online, uh, and then request an appointment, right? Now I can't promise you, because we're not in charge of these things, like insurance compatibility and all that stuff, right? And so they're gonna, they're, they're gonna kind of work it out. And the other tough part for a lot of people is, yeah, we're in these places. Like that's why I showed you the map at the beginning and like so do people do come to us. But, um, Yes, so you don't necessarily need a physician referral unless that's something required by your specific insurance. I guess I was, I was thinking yeah. more of, you know, if it's a hard enough case. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, we don't. The physicians refer their patients down to the family. Yeah, so. The, the, the patient or the, the, the family of that hey. has to advocate for them because yeah. they're not going to say, well, we can't handle this, so we're going to send you down here. They're yeah. Going to make that book. Look bad or whatever. Yeah, no, it's it's yeah, it's either way, and and this is the way that kind of it goes. Yeah, there are, are many times where it's like, okay, well, I don't like. It's not that the your doctor may you know like a community doctor may be not doing the right thing for you. They may be doing the complete right thing, but they've ran out of resources. Right? They don't have all the tools needed to take care of you, and so that's why they get sent over. Right? There are a good number of times. I don't know what percentage, Dr. Mabade, like that. Patients will just advocate for themselves and say, like, look, I want another opinion. It's a good percentage. A good percentage that they say, I want another opinion. I'm just going to go to the Mayo Clinic. And they kind of say, eh, don't tell my doctor yet or whatever. Most doctors, actually, most reasonable doctors don't care. Like, if my patients want to go and get another opinion somewhere else, great. Go to some, you know, other great centers. Get another opinion, right? Because there's some great minds other places. I could have be taking care of a patient for years and just like, you know, you, you kind of get into your groove and you do a certain thing, but maybe I'm missing something. And that's okay, right? We, we, sh we shouldn't all feel like we know everything all the time. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, uh, it's pretty rare. I, I've seen it happen. <laughs> that's pretty rare that the, the doctor gets the referring doctor or the other doctor you've been dealing with gets upset with you. Um, and that may be a bit of a flag is that, that the right doctor for you? I shouldn't say, I'm sorry, I'm like being recorded. I shouldn't say that. Yeah. Sending them somewhere else because maybe they've exceeded those options. And yeah. Being, you know, the, the community doesn't want to, or, or whatever the case may be, I wasn't sure, I was just thinking. And sometimes they just don't, they've, they've run out of resources, right? So there's like a lot of doctors who don't even have an epilepsy monitoring unit, which is one of our most fundamental, Dr. Mabande's there like every day in our unit, um, seeing patients and doing the workup. And so if it's, if it's complicated enough, that's a lot of times one of our first steps. We got to see your seizures. You got to see what happened. Sorry, you had a question. So, yeah. um, the interesting thing about epilepsy is, is that, um, from a parent's perspective, at least, you, you, you don't have a, um, an ending care plan. And that's one of the things that I've, I've asked, and they're like, well, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, if I have, if I injure my shoulder, mm -hmm. I'm going to have sur surgery on my shoulder, and then I have rehab afterwards. Right. So if, if uh, our daughter gets the BMS implanted, yeah. uh, what goes on afterwards? Yeah. And once, once the seizures are controlled, yeah. does she have an aftercare program? For care, yeah. So that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, Dr. Mabanda, do you want to answer? you want to answer? Uh, uh, well, we might have a different kind of... Yeah, and that, yeah, that's a very, very good question. And I was thinking about it when you asking, there's, there's sort of two ways of looking at it. There's the after care approach for a you know, seizure, I am, I'm, I'm seizure free, kind of cured, what is going to happen after that? 
that versus I've had all these surgical approaches to reduce the frequency of seizures yeah. and what's the aftercare approach in that regard. And, and I will say that the majority of individuals fall into the second category and it comes down to the relationship that you have with your epileptologist. Now at the Mayo Clinic we have two kinds of referrals. There are individuals who come to establish care with us. So that's a long-term relationship where over time you continue to follow up with us and you know we have VNS clinics, RNS clinics and so on. Yeah, you're not getting rid of us. Yeah. Never. <laughs> and then and then there are those who say, you know, I'm just coming for a second opinion or a third opinion. I have a primary epileptologist or I have a level four epilepsy center that I'm already establishing. All I need is just the, uh, the opinion which I think is valid. Yes. But, you know, back to your question, I think that it comes down to that relationship that you have with, with, with the epileptologist because it's a continued sort of relationship and the aftercare sort of falls in there as well. Yeah. So I'll, I'll say there are relative guidelines, though, that, that have been kind of put out also that if, if you're on a seizure med, if you've like been diagnosed with epilepsy and you're on a seizure medicine, or if you have a device in, you need to be seeing a neurologist um, at least once a year, right? Roughly once a year. Sometimes it can be off a little bit, even if you're well controlled, even if everything's, you know, great. Um, I think the, the part that gets a little bit funny, you know, again, like we have these two categories, but even those patients who have established with us, sometimes it doesn't happen all the time. We want to happen more is like if we cure them, right? Their seizures go away completely, right? And maybe they get to go off of medicine, which doesn't happen as much as we like. I'll be honest with that. But yeah, that then you still linger with us after surgery for a couple of years. And then it's like this very kind of emotional, like, oh, you don't need to see me anymore. <laughs> like, just come back and say hi or send us notes that, you know, your, your kids are grown up or, you know, you've graduated from college or whatever, right? And those are, but that's like a different situation. So, you, so, you know, the, the honest truth is that once you kind of get um, diagnosed with epilepsy as like a diagnosis, um, it's, it's usual that you will have um, some neurologist in your life. I guess yeah. to expand on that question. Yeah. So the neurologist, and, and we, yeah. we had been asked as the experts yesterday with Dr. Chung. Oh, Dr. Chung, yeah. And, and he, he, was, he was talking about uh, depression and seizures. Yeah. And, and if somebody has seizures and depression, is it going to be more difficult to control? And he said, neurologists don't deal with depression, but they need to in a lot of ways. And, and so my question is, is I guess my the answer that I'm, I'm trying to find is you have somebody who's had seizures and now they're cognitively impaired. So you, you you do what you're supposed to do. You control the seizures. Then what? You know how do you how do you then go on to adjust? To take them back to the pre-seizure basis. Yeah, fixing the cognitive yes. cognitive side so that yeah. now they can go on. And that's that is those are great great questions um, I think there's still a lot of work we need to do in this area but what are we attempting to do right uh, especially like so if you're specifically talking about the cognitive piece um, we've we've tried to instill like programs like prehabilitation so say we're gonna plan on doing like a big surgery that we know that may impact memory get get um, like our speech therapists who do cognitive rehabilitation like involved even before surgery to kind of get them tuned up and then continue that after surgery, right? Um, there are programs um, called, why am I blinking on the name? We always talk about it. Uh, there are programs uh, um, that are available for, for kind of the memory sort of things. Um, depression and that sort of thing, it's, it's a commonplace and I don't necessarily, uh, hopscotch. Hopscotch is the cognitive program. I'm just like, when you're standing up here, you forgive us. Yes. yes. Cognition, yeah, talking about <laughs> cognition, yeah. Um, and then, but like depression and that sort of thing. So like, yeah, so do neurologists take care of depression? Well, yes and no, right? Uh, like we have, I, we have great psychiatry colleagues and actually so what, what happens at our institution a lot of times is um, 
our psychiatrist will maybe will send the, like our patients over to psychiatry like hey you're struggling with you think you need a medication or some recommendations and our psychiatrist won't actually start the medicine but what they'll do is they'll just give us a list of recommendations and then bring it back to the neurologist and go okay well you know them better right you've been seeing them longer you've developed that relationship then they leave it up to us as the neurologist to actually kind of like follow through on that um, on that recommendation you know so there's a lot of different ways they can do it it's yeah it's tough because there's a lot of things that you know go together right there's a lot of overlap this is why i bring this slide back it's like well headaches i mean how many people with epilepsy have headaches almost everybody right anxiety depression almost everybody for being really honest about it right so um we can't ignore any of those things because it's it's part of who you are right it's, it's part of the constellation yeah our psychiatry colleagues hate Kefra. They do. <laughs> Sorry if there's any Kefra reps or anybody. But I mean, we know that that's like a well-known side effect and we've got to take these, yeah, definitely into consideration and switch things off. And that's kind of where um, it's maybe I'll wait to try to switch their medicine before I send them to a psychiatrist because I know that's what they're going to say. You know, why don't you try that first? Um, sometimes you can't do that because maybe that medicine works just all too well, you know. So, so I don't want to be picking on anyone it's all individualized, right? <laughs> Other questions, comments? Oh, yeah. What do you think about x -Cofri? What do I think about x -Cofri? Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> we're, we're kind of not here to give, like, individual <laughs> <laughs> Right? I mean, I shouldn't have even said the word, the, the K word. No. Um, x like, like I like we were kind of saying here, we've got... Um, you know, our, we have an armamentarium of, of a lot of different, oh no, I broke this, of different medications, right? And so, um, you know, you notice we didn't talk a whole lot about medications um, during this or different ones or which ones, you know, better or not because it's so individualized, right? And so I'll just kind of just give a generic statement. It's like, yeah, I think it's great for some patients. I think it's horrible for other patients. But I will say that for any medicine any medicine, right? You have to kind of, and I tell my patients these things like way too, like you can see I'm a very like, I just say whatever. Uh, but I, I'm very honest and say like, look, unfortunately we're not going to really know how you respond to the medicine until we try it. Um, and that's like one of my biggest pet peeves, challenges with epilepsy care and, and the medical management of epilepsy is that, um, oh, sorry, I can stand no, over good. here okay, yeah. so I don't have to move. Uh, so uh, the, one of the challenges is that, yeah, the medications, like we don't really have a great way to know if that medication is going to work or you're going to get side effects from it. And so it's like a, um, I don't want to like, you know, it's, it's like going back to grade school, the math, like the, the, the method of guess and check method, right? So, and that goes back to then the listening, right? So I put you on a medicine, we put you on a medicine. You gotta, t you gotta tell us how you're doing on it. And if it's not agreeing with you, you gotta just be okay with it. And we got other choices, yeah. right? Um, that's why we took a lot of time talking about like, kind of all this surgical and technical stuff. Yeah, here. I just to point out that it's out there. <laughs> oh yeah, we might have, uh, oh yeah, no, it's, yeah, but there's, there's actually more after this. Like this actually, it only goes to 2020. There's a couple more. That, that aren't on this list. So, and we're not picking on any uh, medications. And we appreciate the the um, the pharmaceutical companies for continuing to try to make better medicines. Like, um, I don't think anybody has been on. You know, there's some random medicines down here that we don't even. They're not even on the on the um, availability to prescribe anymore because it's just not not correct. I don't even think we have the bromides on Kefra here. Are you even on there? I can't even oh, yeah. see. It's here, yeah. It's here. It's kind of in the middle. Here. There's a couple ones that are just from dogs and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. So yeah. So there's. It's it's all about individualizing your care. Actually, that's kind of what I like about taking care of people with epilepsy. There's no there's no cookie cutters about it. Like Dr. Bonde is gonna was talking about our epilepsy surgery conference. We can take two people that look almost exactly the same, almost identical, like MRI scans, and, but 
their situations are such that we, we come up with very different different answers for them, you know? Yeah. Um, totally unrelated question, driver's sure. license. So I'm at the point now where I have breakthrough seizures every five to seven years. So when I have a seizure, I lose my license for three months in the state of Illinois. So if I were to try going off of a medicine and switching, or if I have an EEG that induced a seizure, does that law still apply? So I can speak I can't necessarily, I don't know the Illinois state law off the top of my head, right? But there are some states like the state of Arizona, we know that a little bit better. Uh, but the, the state of Arizona, you'll have to look that up. Um, the epilepsy.com website does have uh, references to, so you can read it yourself. But there are some provisions in some states that make it such that, um, like so Arizona, if you were to, if we were to intentionally change medicine on you, um, which we do like in our unit and these sorts of things all the time, if you were to intentionally change the medicine, um, there may be provisions that it goes more to like a physician discretion, like, okay, well, we put you back on your medicine, it's gonna take two weeks before we feel like it's back up to level, so don't drive for a couple of weeks, but you don't have to wait for the whole time. Illinois may not do that, because that's, um, Arizona is one of the most, one of the more forgiving states. Take a look, uh, okay. look it up, consult your lawyer, no. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? So if you're, there's no specific seizure period in Illinois. You might double check, oh, is that from the epilepsy.com website? Yeah, you might double check those kind of resources. Okay. There. Okay. Talk. You can talk to your, because there's some, some, some of them, like you gotta like, look at the fine print. My doctor did, you know, three months, but I didn't know if it was matter if it was provoked or unprovoked. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's very state law specific. Okay. Good question. Happy to answer any questions. Yeah. <laughs> Happy to answer any random yeah. questions you guys have. We're here. Yeah. Are you guys using the, the sorry, are you guys using the genetic testing as well for yeah. seizure treatments? We, for treatments. Well, or to for identify. To identify, yeah, yeah seizures. So, yeah, genetics is uh, a little bit of a hot topic now. I think you got copied on that email that we just, we're starting this, I don't even know what it's, what it, uh, this crowd clinic, uh, which actually, it's it's more of like a, our network of Mayo hospitals. So like for instance, us in Arizona, we don't, we used to have a geneticist on site, but our geneticist moved up to our Rochester campus. So, but it doesn't matter because we're all part of the same network. So what we do is we'll just refer we have telemedicine options and that whole process. And so we benefit from our expertise across our whole um, foundation. And we, yeah, we just started this new process about genetics. And so I'm, I'm actually kind of excited to see where it goes because we're going to get a lot more support. They've kind of formalized it like, okay, here's how we're going to tackle genetics as a whole. So uh, it's more, it's, more complicated than just, oh, here's this gene and this is what happens. Like, there's a whole, like, you, we want to do genetic counseling and say, like, oh, what's going to be the implications of us testing your genetics um, uh, before we actually do that. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Uh, I suppose if you guys have any more questions or anything like that, feel free to come and plug us. So. But, uh, yeah, appreciate your time and uh, hope you're enjoying the class. I'm happy to have those too because I grew up like just a stone's throw away from here.